I'd like to welcome everyone tonight to our webinar, the third webinar in the Natural Area Management Services webinar series, Learn About Expanding Green Industry Services to Your Clientele, a presentation of the Woods in Your Backyard Partnership, which is a cooperative effort of the University of Maryland Extension, Alliance for the Chesapeake Bay, Virginia Cooperative Extension, Penn State Extension, and the Virginia Department of Forestry. This webinar series is made possible in part by a grant from the Harry R. Hughes Center for Agroecology at the University of Maryland. Tonight's webinar, the third in our series, is Landcare Practices for Woodland Health Continued. Last week, we concentrated on parts one and two of chapter four, and tonight we're dealing with parts three and four in the handbook. Tonight's webinar will continue the focus on specific land care practices to achieve landowner goals, such as ways to improve privacy, aesthetics, create natural havens, improve recreational opportunities, and grow and harvest forest products. Our speakers will discuss the use of integrated vegetation management, including the use of forest herbicides, to demonstrate how to, how to control undesirable plants, as well as herbicide selection, common woodland herbicides, application methods, and invasive plant management. But before we move on to them, we have some housekeeping to take care of. My name is Andrew Kling. I'm with the University of Maryland Extension. And working the back of the house tonight is Agnes Kedmanez, also with the University of Maryland Extension. We're with the Woodland Stewardship Education Program, and we want to thank you for registering. We are enjoying this webinar series and hope you're getting a lot out of it as well. Hope you've had a chance to connect with some of the people who've been doing the presenting and maybe even some of the other professionals in your field. I wanna remind you that this webinar is being recorded. When you came into the waiting room, your microphone was muted and your video was turned off. Please keep them in that state. We wanna make sure that everyone's experience is positive and it's best for the bandwidth as well. And I wanna expand a little bit on this last point because I've had some questions about this from uh, some of the participants. The recording will be available through our website at extension.umd.edu slash woodland. It's not there yet. The recordings aren't there yet. When I send out the email that says the recording is available, I send you a YouTube link and that's actually on a private playlist that we have on YouTube. As long as this series is going on, we're making the recording available only to the folks who've registered. Once the series has ended, then we'll make that playlist public and we'll put all that information on our website, but it's not there yet. So if you've gone to YouTube and you've watched one of the other videos and you wanna see the next video, you probably won't find it. You may have to email me for the, for the other link because they're not listed publicly at the moment. So I just wanted to clarify that. And I wanna thank everyone for being, uh, being efficient in helping us with uh, your applications for continuing education credits. But remember, this is only for folks who are joining us live. We have a wide variety of organizations that have said they would give us credits, give you credits for attending. But remember, only if you're attending live. And the trick here is to make sure you're around for the final bit of the of the webinar right towards the end of the evening in that 8 to 8 30 block Agnes will put a link in the chat box that goes to the survey where you fill it out to get an application for the continuing education credits click on that link when it comes up that's the easiest way to do it and please fill out that survey as soon as possible because the survey is only available for a few days through Monday basically um, because this is a weekly webinar, we need to collect all the information as quickly as we can for the previous week and then move on to the next week. And I want to make sure that when you log in, when you come in tonight, and if you're looking to apply for continuing education credits, please make sure that your name in your participation window is the same name that you use when you apply for the credits. And the way to change that, and we had a number of people who did it last week, so thank you. Uh, it really made a big difference. Go to the little box with your name and up in the top corner, top right corner, you'll see a blue box with three dots. If you click on that, it'll give you a chance to change your name to the same name you're gonna use for the application credits. We understand that some people may not be using their personal computer. They may be using their daughter's iPad, that sort of thing. So if you 
have logged on with someone else's Zoom account and suddenly you see that your name is something like Crystal Unicorn, please go ahead and change it to the name you're going to use for the application for credits. It'll help us when I see the Zoom attendance report at the end of the evening and when we send that to the folks who are putting the credit applications together looking through the, the Qualtrics webinar results, we can put the names together and we can get the, the credits or the certificates that you're looking for. We appreciate that quite a bit. And speaking of the chat box, that's the easiest way to interact with us during the, during the evening. If you have a question for the presenters or you want to comment on something that someone else has said, or you need to get a hold of me or Agnes, send us a private message, the chat box is the way to do it. You'll find that at the bottom of your screen. Click on that little uh, cartoon thought bubble, uh, conversation bubble, and that's the easiest way to, to get a hold of us. And we'll go through the questions and comments at the end of the presentations in that last uh, part of the part of the webinar from 8 to 8.30, depending on, on how quickly we get to everything. Uh, we want to make sure that we get to everyone's thoughts. So uh, go ahead and participate. We are having a good deal of information tonight, and hopefully we'll, we'll have some good participation. And finally, we've mentioned this the last couple of weeks, but I want to mention it again. We'll be sending out an evaluation for this webinar series within a week of the final session, which is next week. And please go ahead and give us your honest feedback because that's the best way we learn what worked in these webinars, what didn't work. Uh, let us know what you enjoyed, what we could do better. And really in, in this day and age when everything we do is, is online, it's the best way to get feedback. And it'll help us when we are able to go back to uh, doing face-to-face -face workshops as well. Now tonight's speakers are David R. Jackson, a forest resources educator with Penn State, and Jim McGlone, who's an urban forest conservationist with the Virginia Department of Forestry. I'd like to tell you a little bit about both of them. Uh, Dave is currently employed by Penn State Extension as a regional forest resources educator out of Center County. He has been with Penn State since January 2002. He earned his Bachelor of Science degree from the College of Environmental Science and Forestry at Syracuse and completed a Master of Forest Resources at Penn State. Dave has worked in various positions with the Forest Service, Forest Industry, State Forestry, and Private Forestry Consulting before coming to Penn State. Now, Jim has a PhD in Human Ecology, or as he says, AKA Economics, from Virginia Tech and a Master's Certificate in Environmental Law and Policy from the USDA Graduate School. He has taught economics at Virginia Tech, Ohio State, and Northern Illinois University, and done research at the Economic Research Service of the USDA. A self-taught naturalist and ecologist, he has managed the natural resources of a 500-acre park in Fairfax County, and is currently an urban forest conservationist with the Virginia Department of Forestry in Northern Virginia. He is an ISA certified arborist and has the ISA tree risk assessment qualification. Uh, Jim's going to go first tonight, so I'm going to get ready to stop sharing my screen. I'm going to turn off my camera and mute my microphone. You're just about ready to go there, Jim? I am. <clears throat> okay. I'm going to stop sharing my screen, and you should be ready to take it away. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, as the introduction said, my name is Jim McGlone. I work for the Virginia Department of Forestry uh, in the Northern Virginia work area. Uh, my office is in Fairfax County and uh, I'm going to talk about part three of the of chapter four. We're going to look at privacy, aesthetics, recreation, and some of the products that your clients may want to produce on their land. Um, although I'm going to talk about these in parts, I want you to keep in mind that these things are not mutually exclusive. Great example of this is hazelnut, Coriolis americana. It's got dense branching, so it can make for a good privacy shrub, even though it's um, deciduous, and especially if you uh, plant it in depth. But it also has pretty good fall color. It gets yellow and orange uh, in, the, in uh, the understory, so that's giving you some great aesthetics, and it's also good for softening the forest edge, which I'll talk about later. And of course, it does produce nuts, which will attract wildlife. Um, 
deer and squirrels and blue jays particularly like the nuts that kind of on the small side. And for those who want to be producing stuff, especially for home consumption, if they can out wrestle the squirrels and deer and blue jays, it's going to produce nuts that they can use. So when we're talking about privacy, when we are uh, talking about aesthetics, think about how these things can all work together. So let's talk first about uh, doing planting or, or trying to improve privacy for your clients. One of the things, uh, and this is kind of a pet peeve of mine, is the trees are not fences until they get cut down and milled into boards and rebuilt as fences. I see too many of these privacy plantings where they're trying to get privacy immediately and they're using uh, plants, particularly things like Leland Cypress, like uh, fences. So they're planting eight foot Leland Cypresses on three foot centers, which really works really great for today, but in a few years, those trees are gonna start killing each other as they compete for sunlight. So some of the things that you wanna take into account and the, what I just talked about is when you're working with your clients, if you're trying to build a privacy uh, through the landscaping, you've got to impress upon them the fact that it takes time for plants to grow. And so if you want immediate privacy, maybe the route to go is to actually build a fence rather than try and plant a bunch of stuff that is eventually gonna kill itself. You should also be thinking about what are the sight lines you're trying to obstruct? What's, your, what are the, what's the slope look like? What is the aspect? Um, because those are gonna have an effect on what you plant and how you plant it. Don't necessarily think in terms of one species that's gonna do everything to meet that privacy goal. It may be better to use multiple species, which may require a multi-year process for installation. And again, keep in mind those other goals and objectives. If your client is interested in wildlife habitat, you might wanna go with species that are going to provide wildlife value as well as privacy. Oops. So kind of the basic privacy planting that everybody thinks about is planting evergreens and you plant it and you're done. This can lead to this, this works, but it does severely restrict your planting palette, especially here in, North, in uh, the mid-Atlantic. So the two gray boxes or black boxes are the, the houses that you're trying to screen from each other. The dashed line is your client's uh, board, uh, property line. And what you can do is plant evergreens like um, Leyland Cypress or Arbor Vita or Eastern Red Cedar or um, Eastern White Pine. Or if you're in the more Southern part of the, the area we're talking about, maybe uh, Southern Magnolia, uh, you might be able to get in there. But you wanna make sure that these plants have room to grow. So it would be better to do two rows that are 10 to 15 feet apart and then and plant the, tr the trees on 15 foot centers and stagger the rows. So one row fills in the gap of the other row. This will give those trees a lot more space to grow before they're gonna start killing each other through competition for sunlight. Another way that you can do this, the, the planting is maybe plant trees that don't necessarily have crowns that go all the way to the ground uh, and fill in under those high crowns with shrubbery. This might be a multi-year planting where you plant the trees first and then you come back in five or, or so years once those trees have started to develop an above the ground canopy and plant the shrubs in between them to try to fill that out. The other thing you want to keep in mind is what is your aspect? Because if this is an east-west privacy hedge, you've got to keep in mind that the southern row, that in this case, as I've drawn it, that would be the bottom row, are going to be shading the northern row. So you may want to use a more shade tolerant species in that northern row where you're going to be shading. So think about how the sun is going to be shining on this and think about what the shade tolerances of your plants are because you may get that shading between them. 
the other ask, the other thing to think about is the slope. So this is a case where we have two houses, one on top of the hill, one at the bottom of the hill. And the type of a, a planting you're going to do is going to depend on where that privacy planting is going to occur. So if you're planting on that green line at the top of the hill on the left, you might be able to get by with just thinking in terms of shrubs or some very short trees, but you definitely want something that's going to go all the way to the ground. Whereas if you're planting on the purple line closer to the house at the bottom of the hill, you could get by with trees that have with shorter stature trees that don't necessarily have crowns that go to the to the um, all the way to the ground. And in the middle there, you could be doing uh, taller trees. I talked with one person who was interested in what could he plant to provide privacy. And I started to, uh, and I was looking at his property and started and he said, well, what I'm really interested in is I want privacy for my second floor bedroom, which made it a whole lot easier because then we could start talking about uh, trees that had high crowns that were gonna screen that second floor bedroom but not necessarily give them that screen all the way to the, to the base. So some other things that, that occurred to me as I was thinking about this, um, when you are doing these, these screenings, these plantings, Leland Cypress has basically no habitat value except for bagworms. It's about the only thing I've ever seen eat those things. If your client, that's not necessarily a bad thing, but if your client is also interested in wildlife, you may wanna go and you wanna do that columnar uh, evergreen, you may wanna go with Arbor Vita or Eastern Red Cedar, which are going to produce food for wildlife that you're not gonna get from the Leland Cypress. If your client is really interested in native plants, Arbor Vita is sort of native if you're expansive uh, with the definition, it does grow in the mountains here in Virginia and Western Maryland and Pennsylvania. It's more of a northern species, but it's definitely more towards the east part of uh, the U.S. and Canada. Fortunately, most of the Arborvita, Arborvita cultivars out there are Thusia uh, occidentalis, which is the, native, the eastern Arborvita. The green giant, though, is the Western Arbor Vita crossed with uh, an Asian or a European Arbor Vita. So if your client is really interested in um, native plants, you don't want to use that green giant Arbor Vita. It's not in any way native. The other thing to consider is if you are using um, deciduous trees, there tends to be a, an inverse correlation between leaf size and twig density. If you think about the purpose of twigs is to present the leaves to the sun, the smaller the leaves are, the more twigs you can have on that uh, tree. So uh, deciduous trees with compound or large leaves are not going to give you much of a screen in the winter when the, during leaf off. And this is just a general plea. Whenever you're doing work with your clients, do not use non-native invasive species. Then uh, Dave Jackson's gonna be talking about how to get them out of the landscape. The first step is don't put them in the landscape. Another thing that, that I didn't even really think about until I started considering this presentation are, are native vines, which can add a lot of fullness, uh, interest and habitat to that screen and can reinforce, especially if you're using um, deciduous trees for the screen, it can reinforce that. So things like uh, Virginia creeper and particularly uh, coral honeysuckle, uh, Lanicera semipervens, which is semi-evergreen and flowers from you know, around April into, in fact, I think I still have some on mine in my yard right now here in Fairfax and also be thinking about diversity. And this is uh, whether, you, regardless of what kind of planting you do, you're doing, the last thing you wanna do is plant a row of um, red maple cultivars and have gloomy scale get in it and kill them all. That's going to ruin your reputation with your client. So 
try and get some diversity into your plantings. Aesthetics. Um, this is a tough one to talk about because beauty is really in the be eye of the beholder. Uh, when I work with homeowners associations, I always tell them I do trees that don't do pretty. So I will tell them there's a place where you could put a bed with some native shrubs and some native trees and wildflowers, but you probably want to have a higher landscape designer or find somebody who has that background to actually design that installation. So if you're like me and you don't do pretty, you may want to think about developing a relationship with a landscape designer or learn some of the principles of landscape design yourself. Um, you want to try and figure out what the client's vision is for the property, what they are thinking about the aesthetics, and then think in terms of what plants can we install uh, or what plants do we remove to meet that aesthetic. One of the things I do know about landscape design um, is about softening the edges. So you don't want, generally, you don't want to just have mature forest and then stop and you go straight to ground cover. You want to kind of step down from that mature forest with shrubs along the tree line and then flowers along the shrub line. And again, keep in mind those other objectives. Can I plant something that is both pretty and provides wildlife habitat or provides screening or uh, provides food for the table? So here's one of the things they talk about the, in the book. They talk about havens and points of interest. The points of interest, they actually talk about more in the trail, but that can also be part of that process of a haven. So the trail can go by a point of interest and this would be a place where you might expand something where you can put a bench or a seating area. Um, the picture on the left, this is a rock, a rock outcropping uh, at the State Arboretum in um, Blandy, Virginia. Uh, if I were designing this, I probably would have put the bench on the other side of the trail and softened up that rock with maybe some uh, native ground covers, native wildflowers, where the soil was a little deeper, maybe put in some uh, uh, azaleas or something like that, that would increase the impact of that. Uh, the picture on the right is actually in my front yard. I didn't do this on purpose. I had a silver maple that was in decline and I had it cut down and I had them leave the pieces of the trunk in the yard for my neighbor who uh, has a wood burning fireplace and he didn't take all of it. And so we inadvertently created this little seating spot with just a little opening in front of it where we can go and sit and we get a lot of bees and other things on these, uh, these flowers. So we can just go kind of sit and contemplate. Um, I intend to go out there and sit and watch my neighbors rake their leaves. Uh, which they will then replace with fertilizer next spring. Uh, it's a great deal of comfort for me to know that I don't need to do that. When we talk about softening the edges, this again is my front yard. Whoops, I went too far. So there's a big willow oak here. Planted under the drip line of that willow oak is a dogwood. I've got a star magnolia and a rhododendron in here. And then that steps down to some tall wildflowers and some shorter stuff here in the front. Um, I, I said I don't do pretty. Sometimes I get lucky. This just kind of fell into place uh, without my really planning it out or trying it. Um, and yes, there is, that is my uh, Lanacera, <clears throat> my coral honeysuckle is in bloom. I took that picture last week, I think. The other thing, uh, and this is something I always talk about, people who know me know I'm a turf warrior. I think that there are only two places where turf is appropriate, and that's the infield and the outfield. So when you're building these havens, you're creating some openings in the woodlands, think in terms maybe of ground covers that will have other habitat values or other values besides turf. Um, I always encourage people to interrogate every square foot of turf and say, why does this belong here? Justify your existence. And if you can't, you rip it out and you put something else in. Over here on the left, there is, if you've got acidic soils, 
This is partridge berry, which is actually a shrub. Um, and it grows where you get air, uh, the heaths or the ericaceous shrubs. Uh, the bigger leaves is golden ragwort, which is a go-to plant for almost any site. It'll grow full sun to full shade. It'll grow wet to dry. Um, it kind of likes it in the middle there, but it also provides some nice um, flowers in the spring. And these are wild strawberries growing in the shade. We planted them a couple of years ago and they just kind of sat there and creeped along. And then all of a sudden this year, they have exploded across the front yard under everything else. So, uh, recreation and trails. Um, this is the, I'm not gonna talk a lot about building trails. There's a lot of information in the, the book about how to build trails. I'm gonna leave that for you to look at. Uh, in addition to that, I would recommend the Virginia Department of Forestry BMP manual for water quality. There's a lot of information in there about how to build stream crossings, how to build uh, skid trails, which are a lot larger than you probably are going to build, but the same principles apply. So when you're laying out the trail system, you wanna try and tie together different points, points of interest, uh, different, you wanna go through different cover types, make it more interesting rather than just, you know, we've got a thousand yards or whatever where we're walking and we're seeing pretty much the same thing the whole time. If you don't, if your client doesn't have points of interest on their property, create some points of interest. You might be able to create meadows or food plots or put in brush piles that will attract wildlife. The other thing is, unless your point of interest is like a rock, a rock out plot, cropping, if it involves plants, it's going to change over time. So think about how it's going to change over time. Think about where, you know, how do I want to approach that point of interest, given that I know that in 10 years, it's going to look different. Is this still going to be the best way to look at it? Uh, make your trail fit the purpose. If your client wants to be riding horseback through the forest, you're gonna to have to make a different kind of trail than a footpath. The other thing is if, you're land, if this is a landscape that you're working with and you're gonna be using fires, think about the trails as being fire breaks. And the biggest issue is you don't wanna create new problems with the trails. So as you're putting in these trails, think about how water's gonna be flowing. You don't wanna create an erosion problem. You don't want to create problems where things are sinking into the swamp. And a lot of that is covered in the book, but you wanna be cognizant of where that trail is going and what could happen in the future. This is a great example of a point of interest that was created and a trail that was made as part of it that's actually a fire break. Again, this is at Blandy Farm at the State Arboretum. This field used to be mowed fescue grass. Many years ago, they converted it to a native warm season uh, grass field. Uh, just to, it's not trees, but they wanted to talk about this habitat type. And they put in this trail. Now it's a public place, so they had to put in stone dust to make it ADA acceptable, but are accessible, but that's not the kind of trail you necessarily need to put in. They also manage this with fire. So that trail is not only there for people to walk on, it also is a permanent fire break between two different burn units. They actually have three burn units in this meadow complex and they burn one every year uh, with our folks over in uh, Winchester. Here's the point of interest I came across at uh, Mason Neck State Park. Um, I know it's a point of interest because there's a trail here that's an informal trail. People created this trail by walking over to look at how this chestnut oak collapsed under the butt rot. This was one of my teaching trees. I used to tell them about how that swelling at the basement, there was butt rot in there. Now I get to show the new teacher, the new students, what happens when you've got excessive butt rot. This tree already has fungus growing on it. You've got fungal fruiting bodies on it. Over time, this is going to turn into something more like this. 
This is actually a log that my wife and I picked up on a plant rescue. She saw it with all this turkey tail fungus and said, oh, we've got to have that for the front yard. So it's now sitting in my front yard next to the sidewalk, creating a point of interest for people who are walking up and down the sidewalk. The last thing I'm going to, well, not the last thing, the second to the last thing I want to talk about are products that uh, your clients may want to produce. People like the idea of growing their own food, maybe putting up their own preserves or jams or jellies, and there are a lot of things out there that they can do that with. One of the big issues you're going to have in these small woodlots is when you grow stuff that people are going, when your clients are growing things that people want to eat, the animals are going to want to eat, want to eat it also. So you're going to have to install this in a way either that you keep the animals away from it or you put in so much that there is, that even though the animals get some, there's still going to be enough for your client. Uh, native plants are becoming a big issue, bigger issue with a lot of people. And so you need to understand how native and non-native and the difference between native, non-native and non-native invasive, uh, because not all the non-native plants are invasive. But if they are concerned, say, about native bees and native pollinators, one of the things that uh, you can share with them is that uh, plants in the uh, family Rosacea, which is the rose family, and that includes all of our stone fruits and apples and pears. The bees that we have that are native to this area that use our native Rosacea will also use those um, fruit trees for nectar and pollen. Also keep in mind that some of the plants that people want to grow for uh, products are invasive species. Um, Himalayan blackberry, this is where we get those big blackberries that you see in the store. It's a very thuggish plant. It's a huge problem out on the, uh, in the Pacific Northwest. It's becoming more of a problem here in the Mid-Atlantic because people are planting this thing, the birds are eating it, and they're pooping the seeds everywhere. Wineberry and autumn olive, I've talked with landowners and I've said, well, you know, these things are invasive and you really should get them out of your landscape. And they go, oh no, I'd love to make, uh, in some cases, wine or uh, jelly with the, the berries. Mushroom identification, some of your clients and they talk about potentially growing mushrooms. If you are going to work with your client and facilitate uh, mushroom growing beyond putting in the plants that maybe will cause the mushrooms to grow there, be aware that identification can be very di difficult and if you misidentify it, it can be deadly. So be very careful about that. One of the things, one of the common things we do in landscapes is where we have to remove an oak tree. Uh, shiitake is an oak decay fungus. So inoculating an oak log with uh, shiitake mushroom spore can be a way of introducing uh, mushrooms. The extension office, um, because now we're really starting to talk, especially when you're talking about these food products, this is more about agriculture. If people ask me questions about apples or peaches or whatever, I always send them to extension. I do trees and I taught a pruning class for the master gardeners and I taught them everything that I learned about how to prune trees. And then I had to learn how to prune apple trees. And I discovered that they violate all of the rules that I learned about how to prune trees. They do it completely wrong for your landscape trees, but apparently it works for apple trees. Here are some of our native food plants. Um, in some cases, especially with the strawberries, hazelnuts, and blueberries, you might want to look at cultivars that have been bred for producing larger fruits. Those wild strawberries, they, you know, the, the berry is about the size of the end of your pinky. So it's not a very big fruit. Um, pawpaw is the largest fruit native to North America. And I'm gonna call out these last two down here because, you know, we think about in terms of berries and nuts and things like, and things like that. But one of the things we don't think about is spices. 
So the berries of sum ground dried berries of sumac is actually a spice that's frequently used in the Eastern Mediterranean and through Iran and Iraq, uh, Iran, Iran and Afghani cuisine. Um, my neighbor is an Afghan and I told him that that's what was growing in my yard. And he got really excited. He said, can I pick the berries? And I said, sure. Uh, if you can get to them before the birds do. And if you, you're into Cajun cooking, the filet and filet gumbo, gumbo is dried ground sassafras leaves. So those are a couple of spices that you could grow in the landscape. The last thing I want to talk about is regulations. Uh, in Virginia, silviculture is by legal definition not a land disturbing activity. However, a lot of the stuff that we that I've just talked about, it's going to be really hard to make the case that it's silviculture. So you need to know what the rules and regulations are about land disturbance. In Fairfax County, if you disturb over 2,500 square feet, which you can easily do putting in a privacy screen, you need to get a rough grading plan. Um, in Loudoun County, there are all kinds of rules and regulations about what you can do in flood, floodways along streams. The other thing to keep in mind is, since you're gonna be working with these small lots, if it's, especially if you're working with a client who is in a development where they are all like five acre lots, there may be some restrictions associated with the zoning and the plan approval um, that carry over. So those trees you're thinking about cutting down may actually have legal uh, protection under site plan restrictions. So you need to work with your local county regulators to find out how all these things work. Because if you violate those regulations, that violation is not going to come down on you. It's going to come down on your client. And the last thing I want to talk about is the watershed improvement plan phase three for the Chesapeake Bay watershed. I know that in Virginia, we have said we're going to plant a hideous number of trees. So we need to count everything that gets planted. Uh, Maryland has relied less heavily, but still is relying on individual afforestation and riparian buffer uh, projects in order to meet their Chesapeake Bay water, or water quality goals. So if you are in Virginia and you are planting trees, you can go to this website. This is the DOF My Tree Counts um, app, and you can report your tree planting. And this is my contact information. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dave Jackson. Thank you, Jim, for your presentation. Very interesting. And we are definitely shifting gears now with this one. So. I'm going to dive right into this into the interest of time. Um, we're going to talk about controlling undesirable plants. And I'll just start right off that uh, some of these may be landowner subjective as far as what they're, you know, they might consider undesirable, particularly when we talk about the native plants here. But um, I'll give you what I consider a few definitions here of, and what we're going to talk about. I call them competing and invasive plants. In particular, I consider our competing plants to be our native plants. Um, some characteristics here degrade wildlife habitats, dis diminish species diversity, slow or inhibit regeneration development, and have the potential to limit future sustainability, particularly in a sense if they are inhibiting tree seedling establishment in our forest. And then the others that we're gonna talk about here are what we, and we're gonna spend the majority of time on this invasive plants. And invasive plants by definition are non-native, although some folks will characterize our native plants as having invasive characteristics, but by definition, an invasive plant is not native to the ecosystem under consideration. So these plants grow and spread aggressively they reproduce prolifically and they are difficult to control. And they, all of these plants come in all different forms. So trees, shrubs, vines, grasses, and forbs. So we can find competing plants, invasive plants in all of these different shapes. Competing plants in particular, we, we consider the competition and the fact that they interfere with the establishment and growth of desirable plants primarily by casting dense shade on the forest floor. 
And oftentimes because of that, we call them interfering plants. They interfere with the development, particularly from a forestry perspective of regeneration. And oftentimes our understories are composed of this uh, altered state because of an overabundance of white-tailed deer where a native plant that is not preferred to be browsed by deer can just be in great abundance in some of our understories. And I'll, and I'll go through a short list here of what some of those species might be. So here's, here's the short list, um, American beech, not preferred by deer, but also because of the beech bark disease, we have very dense understories, particularly in our Northern hardwood forests of American beech, striped maple, the same thing. Hay scented fern, New York fern, two rhizominous ferns. So they spread by a root system called a rhizome. So we don't consider all ferns to be problematic but particularly in, in many of our areas up here in Pennsylvania, uh, Hayes and New York can be very problematic in our understories. Uh, grapevine, you see in the lower image down here, grapevine can be very destructive. Uh, it's also a beneficial plant. So that's why I say, you know, the fruit um, may be beneficial to wildlife and some landowners may consider that to be a great asset. I think it, in my mind, it depends on the land objectives, but it also depends on which trees it's growing in. You know, there may be some trees where you feel that's just fine to keep the grapevines there, other trees that may be necessary to remove them. And remove them. And then certainly there's other undesirable plants and we're covering such a wide geographic area. You're gonna see this is probably more Pennsylvania specific, but certainly you have some plants in your work areas that you need to, to think about. And again, it is landowner uh, subjective. So exotic invasive plants, way too many to list. Um, over 1,500 reported across the United States, 106 uh, listed by our Pennsylvania DCNR that are just a terrestrial invasive plants. Um, Pennsylvania's forest based on the US Forest uh, Service inventory data says that 60% of our forests have the presence of at least one invasive plants uh, present. So heavily in invaded our forests are. So most landowners that you're going to be working with are going to have, it's very likely that they're going to have some invasive plant presence there. So what are the impacts? And this is kind of the slide where I say, you know, so why should we care? And, and in some ways, this, these are the talking points that you can use with your clients to convince them that, that you know, these invasive plants are a problem. Here's why you should care. And most of us understand the first one, they degrade native environments displaced native plant communities, decreased native plant species diversity. And if you're decreasing native plant species diversity, you're impacting the uh, wildlife diversity as well. So that's the, the whole issue around decreasing biodiversity. Uh, they inhibit forest regeneration success, lower halt natural succession, which we learned about last week. And this is the biggie, and this is the one that I probably use as the most important selling point on why we should control some of these problem plants. So invasive plants are poor food producers. We rarely, if, if ever, see the foliage browsed. And if we do, it's usually a, as a last resort because other preferred uh, forage is just simply not available. It's been browsed out of those understories. The seeds and berries are eaten on many of these plants, but uh, we, the research has shown that the seeds and berries are very high in the sugars but they don't provide the, the fats and the proteins, particularly that songbirds need for their winter migrations. Yeah. So it's like eating the chocolate candy bar without the meat and potatoes. Uh, and then insects. So we have shown through a lot of research that uh, these non-native plants in particular, invasive plants, they just don't uh, produce many insects and insects are the foundation for the food web. So we have this direct impact on the food web. And I wanna delve into that just really briefly here so that you understand um, how to, to talk to landowners and how to sell them on this point here in particular. So Doug Talmay is someone that you need to be familiar with. I'm sure many of you have heard about Doug Talmay's work. He's an entomology professor at the University of Delaware and has published a couple of books. His newest one is uh, Nature's Best Hope. Uh, if you haven't heard Doug, there's a lot of YouTube videos uh, that you can look them up on the internet. I would highly recommend that at the very least that you listen to one of his presentations. I think they'll be very eye-opening to you. But the work that Doug did, here's, here's one of his research uh, 
um, statements here, quotes that I use, and he looked at a lot of uh, the interactions and relationships between non-native plants and insects and what that ultimately means to the, to the ecosystem and that food web foundation. And what they found was that these non-native, um, what they found was that these introduced species like autumn olive, multiflora rose, and they list a whole host here, Japanese honeysuckle, bush honeysuckle, oriental bittersweet, porcelain berry, calorie pear, uh, bamboo, Japanese knotweed. These, all of these plants are exceptionally poor host plants for caterpillars supporting few to no species under natural invasion field conditions. The other thing that he looked at were our native tree and shrub species and how many insects they actually do support, particularly looking at, in this chart, butterfly and moth species. And if you look far over here to the right, you see our oaks listed. More than 500 different species of butterflies and moths supported on our oaks. And even when you move way out to this end of the chart, you still see that walnuts beach, this is chestnut, so we'll ignore that for the, for the moment here, but even out here, we're still up over 100 different butterfly and moth species supported on our native uh, species. So compare this to the invasive tree of heaven. Tree of heaven supports just two species, only one of them that uh, would be a lepidopteran or butterfly or moth, and that's the Atlantis webworm. The other one now is the introduced spotted lanternfly. So a huge difference there. So oak trees support more wildlife than any other plant. So if you're looking to, to plant something in someone's landscape, these are, are real um, wildlife supporters. And so why does that matter? So this is the selling point that I use is because at 96% of all terrestrial birds rear their young on insects. And so when you're trying to sell the importance to someone about controlling these invasive or, or using even just the use of native species in general you know this is a great selling point and it really touches home with a lot of folks they found just to raise one clutch of these little chickadees here um, they were feeding their young um, till fledgling stage more than 5,000 different caterpillars just to raise one clutch of chickadees and there's some research data that you can look up around they specifically what they found there but I think that's an important point to take home and you know, we always thought that to have birds you needed seeds and berries well to raise baby birds you need insects and and it kind of goes against what we were taught around the landscapes right we were always trying to look for things that didn't support insects. We didn't want our landscape plants to be chewed upon. But when you're working with these clients that are interested in natural areas in these kinds of settings, this is something that really hits home with them. And it really allows you to get your foot in the door about planting native plants and about controlling invasive plants. Because if these birds have to travel far and wide to find the food that they need to raise their young, they're just not gonna survive. So that shifts us to into control. And I use the word control. You know, we have a section in the book about, you know, using proper language and how to get your messaging across and the words to use and what words not to use. You know, we all know we're really looking to kill these plants, right? But uh, we want to use the, the word control when we're speaking with our landowners, our homeowners and such. So we want to use this integrated approach, which means we want to use as many different mechanisms that we have available to us in concert with one another from everything from cultural control where we're making the environment unsuitable for the pest to manual mechanical or hand and machine removal, uh, biological controls like natural pest controls like uh, insects or diseases, what do we have available to us there? And then lastly, as we move up to the top of that pyramid, we're gonna talk about herbicides and we'll spend a good bit of, of our time talking about herbicides this evening. So what do we mean by cultural control? I call that indirect weed management. And some, what are some of the practices that we might be able to implement here? So certainly we heard this from Jim, selecting and planting only native plants, uh, reducing seed spread. This is gonna be really important, You know, cleaning your equipment before you're entering a site. So if you've been mowing a bunch of Japanese stilt grass and you take your tractor to the next homeowner's property or landowner's property, you wanna make sure that you're not moving you know, contaminated soil or seed on that equipment onto someone else's property where you're introducing uh, some invasive 
pest that's going to be very problematic now on a new property. So minimizing soil movement on your equipment, on your shoes, on your truck, et cetera, you know, monitoring topsoil and mulch for weeds that you might be putting into a landscape is going to be real important to make sure that you're not seeing uh, something germinate in there that is going to be invasive. And then when we're doing things like chosen tree management or other kinds of harvest, it's really important to understand that we need to control these plants before we open that canopy up and let that sunlight into the forest floor. There have been many landowners that I have visited with that I don't recommend they do any kind of thinning or harvesting chosen tree management or crop tree management. You might've heard it referred to before they control those understory invasive plants. And then scouting is going to be a big part of it. You know, it's something you could put in agreements with landowners that you'll scout their property because most of them don't know how to identify invasive plants, particularly when they're small and when they're just getting started. That's the time to identify them because they're so easy to get rid of at that stage. And then educating the neighbors about the need to do the same kinds of things. And then lastly here on cultural control is, is manage deer hunting. And that's where we take you to this side. So deer and invasive plants. And I'm gonna share with you just a couple quotes here. The first one here is from Doug Talmy from the University of Delaware, where I heard him state this just recently. The fact that we have too many deer is, is the most important feature that encourages invasive plants in our forest. Deer tip the competitive balance against our native plants. So deer are browsing out our native plants, they're leaving the invasive plants basically untouched, which allows them to really have that additional competitive advantage in many, many areas. And then here, this is from Cornell University and Miami University. If you haven't looked at Bern Blossie's work up at Cornell, he's done some really neat things too, but he states that invasive plant species removal without deer reduction is certain to fail in most instances or only result in only minor improvements. So we've got to be creative in our deer management strategies, particularly when we're working with these smaller acreage properties. Manual and mechanical control, we're talking about things like hand removal, physically pulling plants, um, individual plants, small infestations. We can be a lot more successful with this, certainly when the soil moisture is high so that we can get the whole root system, but being able to identify these plants when they're young, when they're small, is gonna be really important. Uh, things like brush cutting and mowing removes that height advantage. And if you do it often enough, can deplete stored root reserves. But timing is important to cutting. We wanna do cut our cutting or mowing before plants are setting seed and perennials uh, as soon as they uh, finish leafing out. So they've used up those stored root reserves. We cut them back at that time, forcing them to re-sprout uh, and certainly be less vigorous at that time. But really these kinds of removals, the cutting and the mowing really just provides us access. And without follow-up herbicide applications, they're not likely to be very successful. And we really are advocating mowed areas. So if you have to mow something often enough that you're depleting root reserves, it's really not the kind of environment that we're advocating for here. What about maintaining openings like wildlife openings in meadows? We can do this very simply by disking the area on a three-year cycle. We heard Jim talk about there that they're burning on a three-year cycle, one-third of the area annually. You can do the same thing by running a disk and just letting natural vegetation uh, come back on its own. And, and the disking on that three-year cycle is really just often enough to keep these areas becoming uh, from becoming completely invaded by in these invasive shrubs like autumn olive and shrub honeysuckle, multiflora rose and such. So the area that you see here on the right was this just that year. This is a year later that you see what it looks like over here. What about biological control? So learn to identify the insects and diseases that affect pest plants. So two of them that are pretty prevalent in Pennsylvania at this time is multiflora rose with rose rosette disease, which is a, uh, a viral disease that's spread by a tiny mite and then tree of heaven with verticillium wilt. So the verticillium wilt is currently being looked at to be labeled as a biocontrol. So at some point we may have them available to us. Um, but if you do find these on the landscape, you know, maybe an opportunity uh, for it to naturally spread. So learn to identify rose rosette disease and maybe not controlling those plants 
so the mite can spread it to other plants maybe to your advantage. And what about these guys? You know, a lot of folks are really interested in prescribed grazing by goats. Um, there's a number of uh, entities out there that do offer this as a service. Just keep in mind, this isn't an end all be all, but a lot of landowners are interested in this kind of thing. They are non-selective too, so they will graze out your preferred plants, your native plants, just as readily as they will take out your multiflora rows, move the goats out, and those plants are sprouting back as well. But it can offer some opportunities for getting into areas, to getting access to areas that are overgrown, certainly. And lastly, we'll talk about chemical control. And here we're talking about herbicides. And so I say that herbicides are low risk. They're certainly low risk to you, the user. And certainly by comparison to being out there running a chainsaw all day, I would say they're absolutely lower risk, but they're also low risk to the environment. And I'll give you some talking points here in a moment in relation to that. They're effective. This is my colleague here at Penn State, Art Gover. He spent more than 30 years of his career uh, looking at chemical control, particularly focused on non-native invasive plants so we know how to do it. We know the time of year. We have the research. We know the rates. We know the herbicides to use. So we have that information available to us to be effective. Same thing with our native competing plants. Uh, the Forest Service did a tremendous amount of research on those uh, plants as well. They're selective. So we have, and I'll show you here in a moment, very selective application methods, but we also have selective herbicides. So we have herbicides that will just work on seed germination. We have herbicides that will only take out broadleaf plants. We have herbicides that only take out grasses. We have herbicides that can be applied over the top of existing trees. And so we, we can be very selective in our approach when we use herbicides. It doesn't always mean, in fact, it seldom means that we're broadcasting these across large areas. And lastly, I say necessary with a question mark. So oftentimes when we look at these other control measures, uh, we really land here more often. And certainly with um, you know, limited budgets and limited manpower, this is by far gonna be your most productive approach is to use herbicides. So we hear a lot of, in the news, and I know a lot of folks are, are a little cautious about the use of herbicides, and you're going to run into a lot of people that probably are absolutely 100% opposed to the use of herbicides, and that's certainly you know, their opinion, and they have a right to their own opinion. But I'm going to briefly show you a few things here uh, about toxicity is on this graph here. These are some commonly used active ingredients here. Uh, for forestry labeled herbicides. These are forest labeled products, some of the trade names you might run into, but I want you to note the signal words. Almost all of these carry a caution as a signal word. Uh, that's based on the LD50 values over here. So this is the lethal, lethal dose value that all herbicides are tested on based on the acute toxicity greater than 5,000 milligrams per kilogram. So the higher the number on the LD50 value, the less toxic those products are. This is basically off the chart, making these products practically non-toxic from an oral ingestion point of view. Um, even that's very high, that's still only slightly toxic. And then down here, the danger doesn't relate to a product's toxicity. It relates to the ability of that product to cause eye or skin irritation or damage. And so when you see that on triclopyramine formulations, it doesn't relate to its LD50 value. It means you better protect your eyes and you better protect your skin. And so we've gone to using this triclopyr choline formula, which is the new Vaslan product. It still has a high LD50 value, but it only carries the warning label now. Let's compare that to some things that you might encounter even on a daily basis. And if these products like table salt, Tylenol, um, imidacloprid, you know, caffeine, nicotine, this would be the signal word that these things would carry. So if any of you folks are coffee drinkers, uh, the LD50 value on caffeine is only 192, which would mean it would carry a warning label. If you're a smoker, that's a danger poison skull and crossbones and the LD50 value is only 50 and looking at the difference here between our, our herbicides. I'm going to very quickly go through some messaging here. These are talking points that you can use. Um, these are all listed in my 
uh, herbicides and forest vegetation man management publication you can find online. So applied on a small percentage of forest land annually, very small amount are applied less than you know, a, a tenth of a percent. In Pennsylvania, we're treating annually uh, maybe 20,000 acres of land annually. At that rate, we're looking at taking over 800 years to treat all the forest land in Pennsylvania just once. And comparing that to agriculture, just in Center County alone here where I live, we have 85,000 acres of row crop land. And I'm not knocking agriculture by any stretch of imagination, but our agriculture lands being treated annually at least one time uh, with 85,000 acres just here in one county. Applied at very low rates, uh, two quarts to you know, just ounces per acre. So if we're applying even at a two quart rate, that's 0 0.001 ounce per square foot on a broadcast application. So as I just showed you, they're described as very low in toxicity, uh, non-toxic or only slightly toxic based on those LD50 values and all the forestry needs that we have can be met with general use products. They pose negligible human and animal health risks. We saw the health, high LD50 values there, most of them carrying just a caution as a signal word on the label. Um, they do not bioaccumulate in the food chain. They're excreted from animal systems in very short periods of time, and they are biodegradable. They do not persist in the environment. They have short half-lives, only one to two months, and they're degraded by soil microbes. So these are the application methods. As I mentioned to you, some of these can be very selective in how they are done. Uh, even foliar spot treatments where you're just spot treating an individual shrub, you can still be very selective in that kind of approach. So basal bark is where you're treating the lower 12 to 15 inches of the stem completely around it from the ground line up. Uh, hack and squirt or axe frill, we're going to call it hack and squirt, where we're using a hatchet to make downward angle cuts and then filling those cuts with the herbicide. Any convenient height on the stem works. And then stump treatment. So we're cutting something down. We don't want it to re sprout. We're going to treat the stump that cut surface with a herbicide. So those are the application methods. We'll look at these in a little bit more detail. Uh, when we're doing a foliar applications, we can also use a backpack mist blower. You know, these are non-selective kinds of treatments. We're treating that entire understory with a fine mist that's coming out of that mist blower. But in some cases, this is something that you might need if you had extensive fern understory, for example, or extensive area with invasive plants and very little non-preferred species out there. This might be an, an option certainly to be more more productive in the application, you know, large acreage, things like this, this might be the way to go. But basal bark treatments where you're, you're treating thin bark trees, less than six inches in basal diameter, you're wetting that lower 12 to 15 inches of the trunk completely around the tree. These can be done any time of year, including winter months. Um, hack and squirt, use to control individual trees, generally over an inch in diameter. The cuts must penetrate through the bark into the sapwood, and we're going to recommend that you use space cuts. The space between the cuts leaves the phloem vessels intact. The phloem is what's going to move that herbicide downward. You know, you'll see on a lot of herbicide labels, they'll say to treat the cambium. Well, the cambium is a cell division layer, but it doesn't move herbicide. You really are treating the phloem and the xylem or that inner bark in the sapwood. And then lastly, stump treatment. So these are used to control sprouting on cut hardwood stumps. So small stems, you're treating that whole surface. The larger stems, you're just treating that outer uh, living xylem, the sapwood there. Using water-based products, the herbicides are being applied immediately to the freshly cut surface. If you're using an oil-based herbicide, you can apply them anytime after cutting, but when you're using the oil-based product, you're not just treating that sapwood layer, you're treating the sides of the stump and any root flares as well. So what do you need to get started? So you can do a tremendous amount of this work with a simple backpack sprayer. If you're gonna do a lot of basal bark work, I'd recommend a backpack sprayer that has Viton seals because without the Viton seals, the oil that you're using for the basal bark applications, it's probably not gonna hold up for you. Uh, the shoulder saver harness is something you're gonna wanna invest in. You'll throw these, these straps away. This is gonna put the, the weight on your waist there with that belt. 
you know, hatchet and spray bottle is all you need to do hack and squirt work. Uh, a couple of things I'd recommend uh, is investing in the strainer with a check valve. This is going to go right in the tip of your traditional wand that might come with something like this solo backpack sprayer. It's going to shut it off right at the tip so you're not dripping anything when you walk from one uh, target to the next. If you're gonna do a lot of basil work, I'd recommend that you invest in the low volume basil wand. It also has a shutoff already built in right at the tip, um, but it is gonna allow you with the right nozzle to make low volume applications, which is gonna let the product in your sprayer go a lot further. Um, adjustable comb brass spray tip. So invest in different sizes. For basil bark, you want the smallest size aperture they make. When you're doing foliar applications, you're gonna go larger size. And then personal protective equipment, you're gonna need you know, the long sleeve shirt, the long pants, the rubber boots. Uh, gloves, and I would recommend eye protection. You know, most labels, you're going to find some glyphosate label, labels that even just say long sleeve shirt, um, you know, long pants, shoes, and socks. Then you're going to step up to rubber, rubber gloves, and if you're using something with the danger as the signal word, then you need to be protecting your eyes. And of course, we're not applying herbicides with leather boots on. You're going to want to have rubber boots on when you're applying herbicides. So what do you use? We'll just wrap it up here with a, a section on what we use and, uh, and finish up here. So glyphosate, uh, triclopyr, metsulfuron, and sulfametron. So really with these three active ingredients, and I give you some examples of some different products that you can find, but with these three active ingredients, you can pretty much do all of the work that I'm recommending here. There's a few other things that you might need to invest in, but for the most part with these four active ingredients, you can do what we need to do. So the caveat is they have to be labeled for use in your state. They have to be labeled for use on the site, at least in Pennsylvania. If you're gonna use glyphosate in the forest, for example, you have to use a glyphosate that has a forest label. You can't use an agricultural label glyphosate in the forest. And then lastly, I say non-restricted use. So everything that we do, we can do with non-restricted use products. And I would, I would say that you do not, do not tell people that you are using a product that is a restricted use product for our good name and for what we're doing. These are non-restricted use products so in Pennsylvania. That means these landowners can purchase these products and apply them to their own property without certification. Now you as a commercial applicator uh, need to uh, be certified to apply these on anyone's property, but we want to use non-restricted products. So for foliar applications, typically when I'm treating anything, invasive shrubs, invasive vines, tree of heaven, doing foliar kinds of applications, I am mixing all three of these products together at these rates right here. And these are on all of our fact sheets. So these are foliar applications when I'm treating uh, broadleaves and grasses. I'm over here with sulfametron. If I need something with soil activity that's gonna work on seed germination, I'm over here using sulfametron, Japanese stiltgrass, mile a minute vine, for example, fern understories. This is the product of choice. Everything else, I'm using this mixture on foliage. It gives us a much broader spectrum approach that's gonna allow us to control most anything that we encounter while we're out there. Cut surface applications, I'm almost always just using glyphosate for hack and squirt. However, if I'm doing chosen tree management and I'm concerned about root grafting, uh, say I want to uh, control an oak tree and leave an oak tree that might be a neighboring tree, then I'm going to go with triclopyr because it's been shown to not move through root systems very well and it's not likely to, root to move through root grafts. Stump treatments, again, you can use glyphosate or triclopyr water-based formulations of triclopyr, or you can use triclopyr ester, which is the oil-based formulation for stump treatments. Here's the rates, 50%, one to one, and then the um, stump treatments is the same as the basil bark, which we have here, which is the 20% diluted one to four in basil oil. So triclopyr ester formulations, that's what are gonna be our go-to for all of our basil bark applications. So the last slide here basically, so choosing the right 
herbicide and application methods going to depend on a lot of different things. You know, again, the general use product, uh, the products that are labeled for the site that we're applying them to, uh, the selectivity. So do we want to leave grasses? Do we want to leave broadleaves? Do we have desirable seedlings already in place? You know, all of those things can uh, dictate what herbicide that we might need to use. What kind of activity does it, does it have? Uh, we didn't talk about a product called a Mazapir. Mazapir can be a great hack and squirt herbicide for these kinds of applications, but you have to remember that it has soil activity. So don't be spraying it around in an understory because it can be taken up by roots and can kill overstory trees very readily. So you need to know the activity or how a herbicide works, how it's actually taken up through the plant. Uh, what about non-target plants? Do we have any of those present? So that can mean we might need to move to a much more selective kind of application method, maybe basil bark or hack and squirt or stump treatments. Uh, what about the time of year? This is critical when you're looking at controlling root suckering species like tree of heaven or Japanese knotweed. Our time of year is going to be late season applications so that we get good translocation downward in that plant. You treat tree of heaven in the springtime, you'll kill the top, but you won't control the roots. Uh, number of stems, size of plants, and number of acres can all really dictate what method that you use as well. As you can imagine, um, once you get over that six inch diameter mark, for example, you're no longer using basil bark. Now you're shifting to hack and squirt. You know, if you have thousands of stems to treat, you know, that might be using a backpack mist blower rather than using just uh, a, you know, a regular traditional backpack spot kind of application. Number of acres, again, might dictate the same kind of thing. So always read and file the label before, before applying any pesticide. As you all know, that is the legal document. It is the law. I'm leaving this slide here. We're not going to go over any of this, but this will be in the recording. So if you want to access any of these resources that I have listed here, in particular, the first one there is the Penn State Extension Invasive and Competing Plants website. And then the second one is the Penn State Wildland Weed Management website. So a lot of resources there for you to access. I'll leave them here. You can Google these, these topics later if you want to pull this up from the recording. So with that, I will going to turn it back over to Andrew and uh, I will stop sharing. And if there's any questions, we'd be happy to take them at this time. Okay, great. Thanks a lot. Uh, both Jim and Dave, there's a lot to, lot to uh, take in there. And we had quite a few <clears throat> questions to, uh, to go through. The first question was actually for Jim. The question was discuss different time frames for property owners. How long will the owner be owning the house? You'll be dealing with very different plans for optimal appearance utilization after one to two years versus five years or 10 years. Um, yeah, that is certainly a good uh, consideration. You know, if you're talking with somebody who's planning on moving out, you're going to want to be installing stuff, especially if they're looking for, for um, aesthetics and they're trying to increase the marketability of the house you'll be wanting to install stuff that's going to come into its own within you know a few a year or a few years so you may be looking at uh, planting larger specimens <clears throat> so i mentioned for example the star magnolia which is a great spring uh, blooming small tree or shrub um, Normally, I recommend that you plant smaller specimens. Uh, they seem to, you know, the research shows that they're going to integrate into the landscape a lot better when they're younger. They haven't had as long to learn bad habits at the nursery. But if you want something that's going to pop immediately, you're going to have to go with larger uh, species. So you do need to, or larger specimens of the species. So you do need to, to talk about, you know, the kind of time frame. The landowner is going to is looking for some people are really impatient so they're going to pay a lot of rental to the nursery for growing that plant for years so that they can transplant it uh, to get that immediate appeal but the other thing you should be pointing out to them is um and i've done this experiment has has occurred in my landscape i planted a crab apple that i paid fifty dollars for Three years later, a squirrel planted a northern red oak acorn 
that all I had to do was not rip it out of the ground. And now that northern red oak is twice the size of the crab apples. So the smaller species, the smaller specimens will catch up uh, faster. Okay, the next question is, are there any circumstances to plant Bradford pear, especially if properly pruned? Any alternative species provide its tight upward growth suited to crowded side lots, alleys, or tight spaces? Um, almost any, uh, I cannot think of any reason at all to, to plant Bradford pears. Uh, they have a very poor track record in the environment there are some other pears, but I really don't want to recommend calorie pear to anybody. That is exploding across the landscape. Um, you know, I'm not really a landscaper, but there are a number of columnar um, or fastigate. Uh, somebody is pointing out Ptolemy reports zero species. That's not quite true. He did find one caterpillar uh, on his neighbor's Bradford pear, but. <laughs> uh, columnar Armstrong maple. Um, so you may want to go, if you're looking at those tight spaces, you might may want to go to a fastigate uh, cultivar of some of them. And it depends on what you're looking for in terms of, uh, you know, do you want the spring flowering or do you want the, uh, the fall color or uh, are you just looking for something that's going to fit that tight space? And there are lots and lots of cultivars out there. Uh, service berry and so sourwood, I don't like to recommend yet. Um, give it a few more years. It's still more of a southern species. Uh, I've had people call me and say that sourwood is not doing well in Arlington. And I tell them the main problem is it's in Arlington where it doesn't belong. But there are a lot of other species you can plant besides uh, a calorie pair. I know in Fairfax County, the developers don't plant them anymore because they don't get any canopy credit for it. Okay, there was a question and there was some discussion about filet. Uh, someone was asking, isn't filet considered carcinogenic now? And one of the con comments was that only the roots of sassafras contains right. the carcinogens. Is that correct? That is my understanding. It's the roots. That's why we don't use it in um, in root beer or uh, any beverages anymore. Or drink the tea, but my understanding is that the um, the leaves are not. And the other thing you've got to think of, you know, uh, Dave talked about the LD50. Um, you're not using that much uh, when you're cooking with that even if you're doing it all the time. And certainly the Cajun uh, Creole people use that a lot. And I haven't heard that the filet causes uh, cancer. Okay, there, there's one question uh, that's a specific question and one that's a larger question. So I'm gonna put the two of them together. Uh, the question was, will we be able to get the, the slides from this presentation in particular, one of the uh, questions was about the bar, bar graph that Dave shared about the number of butterfly and moth species supported. Yeah, I see that Julianne actually put that in the chat as a downloadable Word document. And I actually found it online just by Googling that. So I was able to look up Doug Talmy's work and find that particular chart. And that's uh, how I got it in the PowerPoint. So I think if, if we don't share it either way, I think you'll be able to find that information. Okay, one of the next questions is, how would you inoc inoculate verticillium wilt? So first it's important to understand that it is not legal at this point to move it around until we actually have it licensed as a biocontrol. So unfortunately, even though it was discovered naturally occurring in our state, we're still not allowed to uh, take you know, pieces of infected trees or contaminated soil and move it to other sites. So I'm gonna defer from answering that question. <laughs> and, and the short answer would be not yet, I guess. Yeah, that's the short answer. Although I know people have done it. <laughs> Okay, uh, I see that it is a little past 8.20 when we have quite a few questions. So I just wanna warn folks, we may go a little past 8.30. 
so Agnes, why don't you go ahead and put the link in the chat box now in case we go past 830. We have it there and then we can put it in again when we finish up. Uh, this one is uh, this one is for Dave. Please spend some time discussing what is an invasive species and how to talk to landowners about them. I'm looking at the invasive.org web website, which lists ponderosa pine, eastern red cedar, eastern red cedar, Douglas fir, eastern white pine, and tree of heaven as invasive species. I can see tree of heaven on this list, but eastern white pine isn't the definition and criteria for invasive species quite arbitrary and subjective. Tell us what to say to clients. <laughs> yeah, so invasive by definition, as I mentioned, the one part of the definition states that to be invasive, it has to be not native to the ecosystem under consideration. So it is a plant that's not a native plant to the area that you're examining. So it's not a native plant to that landowner's property. And then the second part of the definition that has to be met is that it has to have the ability to cause economic harm, environmental harm, or harm to human health. And so most of the plants that we're dealing with, we consider them to cause environmental harm. So we look at those, those issues around uh, biodiversity, uh, regeneration success, halting succession, and then the impacts on wildlife, particularly from a food point of view, whether they're not producing insects, whether the food doesn't provide the nutrition that's necessary, uh, whether the foliage isn't, isn't browsed by herbivores, you know, so those are the issues around it. And so, you know, I think those are the big talking points that you need to, to use with folks. Okay, question about the LD50 values. Uh, they, the question was, they apply only to humans, correct? What about amphibians and others that are very, very different biologically? So the LD50 values are actually based on acute toxicity. So it's a one-time short-term exposure and they're almost always tested on rats in laboratories. And so those values are actually on those rodents so it's a lethal dose when 50% of the test population, when it was fatal to, act, to the test population roads. And it's measured in milligrams of pesticide per kilogram of body weight. Milligrams of pesticide per kilogram of body weight. So we wanna see really high LD50 values to have products that are practically non-toxic from an acute toxicity point perspective based on ingestion. And every pesticide is tested based on its LD50 value and many, and probably almost all of them are tested on other uh, ways as well. But that's, that's the biggie and that's the basis for the signal word that you find on the label. Okay, specifically for porcelain, excuse me, for porcelain berry and English ivy, how do we control those? I'll have to defer that to maybe others on our group if they have experience with that. Those are two plants that I absolutely have no experience with. It's not something that I have encountered in my career. Luckily, it sounds like. <laughs> well, um, <clears throat> porcelain berry is a woody vine. Uh, it depends on how old it is. Uh, some of the methods that uh, Dave talked about um, work pretty well. I have done dealt with porcelain berry in my backyard using a triclopyr product. Um, it was brush be gone, which is an over-the-counter uh, triclopyr. Somebody is pointing out it sprouts up everywhere. Uh, one of the things that I would uh, add to what Dave has said is when you're dealing with those perennial plants, you need to think about them as root systems that are trying to grow and survive. And they do that by putting up the top part. Um, English ivy is a lot tougher because it's got such a th thick cuticle. Um, you need to have a surfactant that's going to get, if you're going to use a chemical to get that through it. Um, again, both of these things you can control by pulling. It may take uh, multiple applications of that. And as Dave said in his presentation, when it is, um, when the ground is moist, that's when you want to pull it. 
but with English ivy, the big issue is you don't want to let it get up into the canopy of the tree because that's when it's going to mature, the leaves will change shape, and it'll start putting out flowers and berries, and that's when it becomes really invasive. So just keeping it from climbing too high into the tree uh, can keep it more or less under control. It's still going to spread on the ground, but it's not going to spread across the landscape by uh, birds. Using herbicides on triclope or on uh, English ivy, like I said, is really tough. One thing I've seen or recommended was to first you spray the English ivy with something like a uh, dishwashing liquid that'll cut through that wax and then you treat it with an herbicide to get it into the leaves. For the bigger vines, you can treat those uh, either as with hack and squirt methods or cut stump, and they're actually a lot easier to deal with that way. Thanks, Jim. Okay, Dave touched on this one towards the end, asking about the timing for Tree of Heaven herbicide application, but what about the timing for bush honeysuckle? So it depends on the application method. So if you are doing foliar applications, I start as early as I have full leaf out and I go right through until fall coloration with foliar applications. So it is not a root suckering species. And so it can be controlled as soon, but with foliar applications, as soon as it's fully leafed out. Um, basil bark is year round and stump treatments can be year round as well. Uh, I did have one lanner that actually hack and squirted it, but I don't recommend hack and squirting um, bush honeysuckles. But certainly I control them on my own property with basil bark and I treat them or with stump treatments and I treat them on the wood lots that I manage for Penn State with basil bark quite often year round. Okay, next question. What is the half-life of Escort XP and do you worry about its persistent persistence in the soil negatively affecting trees, shrubs, herbaceous plants that you wish to keep at your application site? I don't, I don't have that number right off the top of my head. I would have to look up what the half-life was. Um, we're using it at an extremely low rate. If you noticed what I had on my slide was only one ounce per acre. It's particularly effective on multiflora rows if I was gonna pick one product um, to use and I only had multiflora rose on site, that's what I would utilize. Um, I understand it does have some soil activity. So again, you have to be cognizant of where you're putting it. These treatments are only spot treating invasive plants. So you're treating individual shrubs in your forest. This is not a broadcast treatment where we're using that broad spectrum kind of approach. So, you know, from that point of view, you have to be aware of where you're putting it and where these desirable plants are so that you're not impacting them. And maybe you need to switch to some more selective means of application if that were the case. Okay, what's the best time of year to treat stilt grass? So typically with stilt grass, because it's an annual and it's a fall seeder, uh, we're treating it early. So we're using in, in the example that I used, um, and there are other products, but I use a forest labeled product, the sulfometron. It is not a pre-emergent herbicide. We don't have a forest labeled pre-emergent herbicide, although folks use it. it the, the pre-emergents just actually work on that seed germination process, the true pre-emergent herbicide. We don't have one that's labeled for forested sites. We have one that's labeled for roadsides and rights of ways and different things like that, non-crop sites, they call it. But um, treating it early, um, you know, as it's germinating with sulfometron, so you it'll affect seed that's in the soil, it affect those that already have germinated. Uh, if you have it in areas where you might have some other desirable plants present, you can use a product called a Mazepic. It, it has a lot of selectivity around some wildflowers, um, native grasses, things like that. So Mazepic is another uh, opportunity for you to be a little bit more selective with it, but treat, treating it early season, having that long soil residual with sulfometron is gonna give you control as that seed 
uh, continues to germinate throughout the summer months. Thank you. What do you think about using a pre-emergent such as preen to prevent new, new invasive growth and does it kill earthworms? And that's not a product that I am familiar with. I'm pretty sure that preen does not have a forest label or I probably would have heard of that. And I have no idea about the earthworm issue. Sorry about that. The, the comment is preen is used more on lawns than anything else. Okay. Okay, great. Yeah, that's an important po point, folks, is that if you're moving your businesses into the forest, check your state regulations. But in Pennsylvania, the product has to be labeled for the site that you're using it on. So you may need to, uh, even if it's the same active ingredient, you may have to upgrade some of your products to forest labeled products. The same is true in Virginia. Okay. Okay, I think the last one here is, uh, can we talk about the herbicide effect, effect of herbicides on amphibians and reptiles? Yeah, good question. I, I will tell you that um, it depends <laughs> how, you know, and, and here's how you work with folks around this is that our application methods are critical so we are, are not recommending to the small acreage owners by any stretch of imagination to go out and do broadcast applications. We are gonna be extremely selective in our approach. And if I am doing a hack and squirt, if I'm doing basal bark, if I'm doing stump treatment, and, and honestly, likely even spot applications to foliage, then the concern around amphibians is next to zero. I, I don't have research right at my fingertips. I'm not going to give you, you know, a specific answer. You know, if you were to spray an amphibian, what would happen to it? I, I don't know the answer to that question. But I would suggest that you look at how selective that you can be with your application methods. Or you're, or you're likely not to be allowed on these properties applying herbicides. So I, I think you can really talk to that nature of the, this opportunity to control a plant by very, being very selective in your approach. And that means the application method that you're gonna use is, is really important. Okay, this may... Um open up a, a semantic can of worms. The question is, what constitutes a forest? Is it five acres, a woodlot, is, fi is a five acre woodlot a forest? I, I've seen a, a variety of debates about what's a forest, what's a woodland, what's a jungle. So <laughs> I'd like to get your opinion on that one. Yeah, so our, our study is basically, you know, it's tree overstory and it's not mowed lawn underneath, so. If you're mowing underneath your trees, it's not a forest. Yeah, I would agree with that. However, in Virginia, there is a legal definition of uh, forest land. Yeah. That starts with 20 acres and basically it's capable of producing a uh, commercial crop of uh, woody plants. Um, and that gets into that regulation thing because if you're under 20 acres and you know, you've got to look at what the underlying zoning is as far as what is legally a forest. Uh, yeah, so and I don't know that, that, yeah, and that's an interesting point, Jim. I'm not sure that herbicide labels relate to that kind of legality. No, it doesn't. Yeah, if you're yeah okay. That, it's a woodland application. So you're applying to a, um, you'd be talking about a forest is where you have an ecosystem dominated by trees. Um, yeah, yeah, I think you're right there. I think you just nailed it, yeah. Yeah, well, that, that's not mowed lawn underneath. That would be a woodland in that. So we're not really using the word forest. Most people think of forest as these really large areas that are managed by, you know, the state government, for example, or the forest, the U.S. Forest Service. It's not what we mean by forest. We mean woodland habitats that are dominated by tree cover. Yeah. 
Okay, we've run over, but I think we have covered all of the questions. So I want to thank everyone for joining us tonight and remind you that we will have the fourth webinar in the series next week, Thursday, November 12th, 7 p.m., same time. And before you go, Agnes has included in the chat box the link to the survey. If you're looking to get continuing education credits, go ahead and click on that link tonight. Uh, do so before you leave here. It was uh, uh, very important to make sure that you get that. And she's just done it again. Thank you very much, Agnes. So next week, the last in the series, introduction to the Woodland Health Assessment Checklist in the guide. And we'll also talk a little bit about incorporating woodland health practices into your business. So that's the same time next week, Thursday, November 12th. We'll send out an email with a link to everyone who's registered, let you know how to find us. It's the same URL if you don't see it. So just come back to the same place, same time. So on behalf of Dave and Jim and Agnes and myself and everyone else at the Woods in Your Backyard Partnership, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us tonight. Great discussion, a lot of interesting topics taken up, a lot of great information. So I wanna thank you for joining us tonight. Enjoy the rest of your evening and have a great week. Good night. Good night.